Thank you, Chris, for such a wonderful introduction. I hope I live up to our expectations. The subject of this public lecture, famous the world over, needs little introduction. In popular culture, he is a common byword for travel, adventure, east-west exchange. He is the subject of countless popular and scholarly biographies. His book, An Account of Peoples and Communities Beyond Europe, written at the end of the 13th century, often entitled Le Divisement du Monde, or as I shall refer to in English, the description of the world, the description for short, is the focus of a myriad of scholarly analyses and historical inquiries. Despite his celebrity and all that has been documented about him, my talk today still centers on the most fundamental question about this man. So, who was Marco Polo? These are the basic circumstances of Marco Polo's life as we learn from his book and the existing documentary sources. By his own account in the description in 1271, at the age of 17, Marco Polo left Venice with his father and uncle to travel east to the Mongol Empire. After several years of journey, they arrived in the dominion of Kublai Khan the Mongol ruler who founded the Yuan Dynasty in China. There they settled, and Yuan China was their base for the next 17 years. According to Marco himself, he served for three years as the governor of Yangzhou, a prosperous city on China's east coast near Hangzhou, a famous historical city that the Venetian appropriately describes in his book as a center of cultural brilliance and beauty. When the Polos departed China on their return journey to Venice, it was as members of an entourage of a royal bride-to-be traveling by sea to the Ilkhanate, a dominion covering roughly today's Iran and neighboring areas. A Chinese source corroborates the sea voyage as having taken place in the beginning of the year 1291 from the poor city of Quanzhou in the Chinese province of Fujian. The Polos reached Italy a few years later, and as legal and business records of the Polo family show, luxury goods from the Mongol Empire, such as musk and rare textile, as well as tablets of authority made of gold, were in their possession. And these tablets were things that the emperor gives you so that you can carry out your business and the emperor's business unimpeded without um, bureaucratic red tape in the empire. Okay. Business records show that Marco continued to engage in commercial ventures after he returned from Asia. With the wealth that he brought back, he was able to invest nicely in real estate and enlarge his fortune in land holdings. Records show that at his death, his estate was considerably more substantial than the holdings and legacies of Polo relatives who had stayed behind in the Latin West. In his will, he emancipated a slave that he had brought back with him from the Mongol Empire, who remained in Venice and later attained Venetian nationality. At the end of the 13th century, Marco collaborated with the compiler and, and writer of romance, Rusticello de Pisa, on his book, The Description. The precise circumstances that brought these two men together are not clear to us today, and there is no documentary basis for the familiar tales of Marco's being captured as a soldier in the war between Venice and Genoa. What is known, however, is that Marco met Lucy Calo, likely in a Genoese state prison where they were both prisoners. The result of their collaboration, the description, captured the imagination of European readers and made Marco a celebrity through the ages. Despite such facts as are commonly told about Marco Polo, there remain questions about who Marco Polo was and what he did in his life. Many scholars, for instance, doubt his claim that he was the governor of Yangzhou for three years. 
Yet to this day, there is not one single piece of documentary evidence in Chinese archives for the Polo's existence under the Yuan Dynasty. The most famous challenge to Marco Polo's story comes from eminent Sinologist Francis Wood, who has questioned whether he was ever in China at all. Her book, Did Marco Polo Go to China?, points out that this world-famous Venetian fails to mention the Great Wall, tea, chopsticks, and the distinctive look of Chinese characters as writing in his account of China. So how could he have been to China and not written about such familiar things in Chinese civilization? Francis Wood's book remains the most well-known and most widely cited of numerous challenges to the validity and veracity of the description as Marco's, Marco's account of Yuan China. These challenges have served to focus the intellectual conversation on who Marco Polo was and his place in history. Such a conversation attests to the fascination that Marco Polo as an historical person has exerted and continues to exert on the world. And the reason we're fascinated with Marco Polo is that he claimed to have crossed diverse boundaries and overcome disparities in language, culture, geography, and even political government. Venetian by birth, governor of Yangzhou in China, a multilingual wonder at the Mongol court, an expert on the dominion of the great Khan, and a merchant from Italy. His story makes us wonder how he managed to adjust to radical differences of environment and social system, and if he actually did manage. The story of Marco Polo, as he tells us himself in the description, is not just one of crossing boundaries and having access to a diversity of cultures, communities, and social groups, but it is also a story of accomplishment. His account of the East is also one of personal success in a distant empire, serving the emperor and traveling on behalf of the emperor to survey his dominion and being rewarded for his service to the great man with dis distinction and authority. The story of a man from Venice who went to live and work long-term in China under Mongol rule has received attention from academic fields as disparate as medieval studies, Sinology, Mongol studies. Yet scholarship in these fields has conceptualized Marco Polo's identity differently. For medievalists, for instance, Marco Polo was a medieval European who drew upon medieval literary traditions in his account of the East. The Venetian's description of foreign places and peoples also raises the issue of Orientalism for scholars in the field of Western literature, as Saeed Masul Islam has characterized the description as an exemplary instance of the Western discourse of othering. Sinologists also view Marco Polo as a Westerner. Their concern, however, is not to find out whether or not he ever regarded Asians as primitive and inferior to Europeans. Rather, they ask how he could have overcome linguistic, cultural, and political barriers to adapt to Han Chinese civilization in the later 13th century. For them, Marco Polo's story of personal success in China is highly suspect in the first place because he does not appear to know the Chinese language and does not appear to have a proper understanding of traditional China in his written account of the East. Francis Wood's challenge to the description ostensibly disputes what seems an established historical fact, that Marco Polo went to China in the 13th century, but really it is making a rhetorical rejection of the Venetian's claim on China, that is, his sense of his right or entitlement to speak on China because he lived there for a long time. Their problem with Marco Polo is, how could a man from Europe 
who evidently did not know the Chinese language and showed little or no knowledge of traditional China, have understood Han Chinese civilization. Until recently, Sinologists answer to the question whether Marco Polo had a proper understanding of China was a resounding no. In the last decade or so, the reception of Marco Polo's book in Sinology has seen a reversal in fortune. Where the emerging trend is to celebrate Marco Polo as a man who acknowledged China as the great civilization that it was, even with the growing counter-argument in Sinology against the easy dismissal of the merit of the description, there is a powerful sense in the field that the legitimacy of this work depends fundamentally on the author's allegiance to Chinese national identity, or so-called Chinese values, as the modern authorities of China define them. As my discussion of scholarship on Marco Polo in different fields suggests, even as we see that Marco Polo visited and wrote of diverse places, communities, and peoples, our imagination of the 13th century merchant's personal identity shies away from multiplicity. We persist in imagining that he must be one fixed identity or nationality, that his place in history was with the West or Han Chinese civilization. But we all know that you are who you are, not just in terms of your genes or your DNA, but also because of where you live, where you have been, and the people you have interacted with. The places we have been and the people we have dealt and associated with have shaped us. So China under Mongol rule in the 13th century and the people and communities there also made Marco Polo who he was. As Marco Polo crossed geographical and cultural boundaries and moved from one community to the next, he also took on different social roles and presented himself as he imagined and wished in different situations. In this way, he would have been radically different from individuals living in traditional conditions in his sense of himself and how he played a part in history. The 17 years that Marco Polo spent in China were the most formative years of his life. These were the middle years of his life from the peak of his youth through his middle age. What was the place that shaped Marco Polo in the middle years of his life, and who were the people he came into contact and socialized with there? During this period of his life, he was far away from European civilization in China. But China, as Marco Polo lived, was not just traditional Han civilization, but an empire under the rule of the Mongols, alien people that the Han Chinese regarded as barbaric. For the first time in history, China was under the rule of an alien nomadic people, and it was known as the Yuan. The new, excuse me, the new rulers from the steppes encouraged and actively brought about the movement of foreigners from Central and West Asia and Europe into China on a large scale. There, the foreigners settled and spread all over the country, forming local communities and pursuing their own development. Marco Polo and his father and uncle were among the foreigners who moved to and settled in Mongol China. The term I know that best describes Marco Polo's experience in the prime of life under Kublai Khan's empire is immigration. To understand who he was and his expression in the, the description, we have to understand the place that he immigrated to, China under Kublai Khan, and the people and cultural communities he came into contact with in this place. One major objection to Marco Polo's account of China from sinologists is that he shows no knowledge of the Chinese language. But we all know that being part of a civilization does not just mean conforming to an abstract, homogeneous notion of a culture by living and functioning in an historical place, 
while making use of whatever tools and values available in that place to survive and grow. For instance, right here in the city of Los Angeles, a substantial number of individuals who live long-term in the city are non-English speakers. They may, acquire a, they may acquire a smattering of English, but will never learn to speak English fluently or functionally. But they are as much part of the vibrant culture of LA as the Anglophone residents of the city. They speak Spanish or Korean or Farsi, and they identify themselves as residents of LA. They know how to navigate the city to get what they need and engage in social interactions. They may even serve as authoritative sources of information on the city's good eats, best bargains, and the practices and ways of life that help you survive in LA. Marco Polo's story is in many ways like the story of people from outside the United States who moved to LA, live here long term to conduct business, raise a family, bask in the prestige and superabundance of this cosmopolitan city. Such people may maintain ties with their home country even as they assimilate into the community in LA. They may live for the rest of their lives in LA or upon retirement return to their home country and regale the locals there with the incredible, marvelous tales of LA but their personal stories put a human face on the history of immigration in the United States. I want to suggest that this is how we should understand Marco Polo's book, as the expression of a man who went to live for a long time in a prestigious cosmopolitan civilization and returned home to tell all, of the grand, tell all, all, all about the glamour and wonder of this civilization. In the case of Marco Polo and the early Yuan Dynasty in the 13th century, I use the term immigration in a very basic literal sense to refer to the movement of people into and settlement in a foreign country on a long-term basis. I use it as a very broad umbrella term to cover diverse groups of people who migrated to China and made it their home during this period from those engaged in trade, technical and professional personnel, to political advisors and administrators under the rule, under the service, serving the Mongol rulers. Sometimes I see in discussions of US immigration, a distinction is made between immigrants, individuals who voluntarily come to America and settle here because they think this is a desirable place to live, and refugees, people who flee persecution or the disastrous collapse of their native country. But such a distinction is not absolute, and both groups are central to the history of immigration in the United States. As Marco Polo himself recounts, his father and uncle's first movement eastward to the empire of the great Khan was marked by tentative steps rather than a steady, determined drive to an unknown country. Both the circumstances of war, which prevented the brothers from westward return to Constantinople, and the active recruitment of a powerful Mongol official pushed them eastward to connect with Kublai Khan's empire. As the Polo's case shows, immigration takes place often as an unexpected turn of events rather than as a firm, permanent commitment to adopt a foreign residence and identity. I do think, though, the conditions of captive slaves moved into China by their Mongol masters differ from those who moved there on their own because they did not desire to be in China, and there they could not pursue personal development as they wished. And I will point this out where possible. China, of course, is not a country known for a proud history of immigration, nor particularly celebrated for its immigrants and their descendants. By the time Marco Polo made his way to the Mongol Empire, China had been the elite civilization of great prestige, advancement, wealth, and magnificence in East Asia for nearly 2,000 years. 
the other great civilization comparable in its achievement in science, technology, learning, and refinement was Islam to its west. Yet compared to Islam, Han Chinese civilization historically displayed remarkably little or no interest in foreign peoples or places. The difference is best illustrated in the case of geographical knowledge and map making as the work of pioneering historian of Chinese Islamic relations, Hyang Ki Park has shown, Muslims inheriting a grand worldview from the Greeks and Persians had the ambition to map the entire world. While Confucian China's cartography was devoted just to charting China itself. Very few Chinese people voluntarily traveled westward and visited lands beyond Confucian civilization, while Persians, Arabs, Jews, and Turks were interested in China and traveled there. By virtue of China's prestige and wealth as a great civilization, it historically attracted foreigners interested in commerce, technology, and the refinements and luxury of culture. Movement of foreign peoples into China was not forbidden before the 13th century, but Chinese authorities controlled and limited the settlement of foreigners from distant lands, mainly to trade cities, many of them on the east coast of China. Before the 13th century, the majority of foreigners to settle in China consisted of merchants from Central and West Asia. Most of them were Muslims, but there were also considerable numbers of Jews, Nestorians, and Zoroastrians. Many of the descendants of these foreign settlers assimilated into Han Chinese civilization and maintained a powerful interest in maritime commerce. One such person was an, a powerful official from the Song Dynasty, that's the dynasty before the Yuan Dynasty. His name was Pu Shougeng, who along with other descendants of foreign settlers, supported the new regime because of its friendliness to their business interests. Pu's Chinese surname, in this case, refers to the Arabic word Abu, meaning father of. In the 12th century, a Chinese compiler of foreign communities and peoples celebrated a local Muslim merchant in Quanzhou, a famous historical port city in southeast China, who established a cemetery for forgotten foreign traders who had died in China and had no one to bury them. The merchant was named Shi Na Wei, and it has been argued that his last name Shi refers to the home of his ancestors, Sirav. With the arrival of Mongol rulers in China under the dynastic regime called Yuan, foreigners began to move into the, large, into the country on an unprecedented scale in the 13th century. Mongol rule in China saw the greatest diversity of Chinese civilization in ethnicity, language, and culture. The rulers from the steppes actively sought foreign personnel to manage and maintain their empire in China. Because of Kublai's friendly relations with his brother's dominion, it's called the Yokhanate, which comprised modern-day Iran and neighboring regions, the Yuan emperors recruited many officials from the Yokhanate and brought them into China to serve the Chinese imperial state. The court of the Yokhanate itself was very diverse, as we have a very famous case of a peasant named Isolo serving the Yokhan Gazan and a Kashmiri Buddhist monk working with the vizier Rashi Adin in his monumental history on Mongols and their empire. While the number of Persian bureaucrats and officials who went to work in China under the Yuan was fairly significant, the number of Chinese professionals and administrators who moved in the other direction into Iranian civilization was negligible. Many of the Persians under the employ of the Yuan emperors would have been technical and professional personnel such as scientists, 
physicians, and engineers. Religious personnel or holy men were another highly desirable group to Mongol rulers as they re respected all religious faith that promised good things for the empire. Persian translators were high in demand, not just to serve as interpreters in official functions, but Mongol princes were also interested in having scientific and medical writing from Islamic civilization translated and made accessible to the academic and scientific community in China. Many Islamic scholars of astronomy, geography, and medicine, particularly, went to China to work on scientific advances with native Han Chinese scholars. While some Han Chinese scholars rejected cooperation with foreigners, others did work with them. Ultimately, Persian and Arabic astronomy, geography, and medicine contributed greatly to their Chinese counterpart. In their expansionist undertaking, the Mongols would have also come into contact with Italian merchants, many of them who many of them traded as slaves. The Mongols first came upon these merchants from Genoa, managing trade posts in the Crimea early in the 13th century. They sold the Genoese merchants people that they had captured in war in exchange for trade goods from Europe. Then the Genoese sold these captives in slave markets in the Mediterranean. There were also considerable numbers of war captives from Europe, from Central and West Asia, who worked for their Mongol masters as slave labor. Many of the Europeans that the Mongols captured in their advances against the West towards the middle of the 13th century were technical people and skilled laborers, from craftsmen, scribes, miners, to the Parisian goldsmith that the friar William of Rubric met who worked as a slave in the imperial household. They would have worked alongside those war, war captives from Islam under Mongol masters. Some Russians went to work in Yuan, China as translators for Kublai Khan, but the largest group of Russians to move and settle in China were slave soldiers, 10,000 Russian troops installed in the year 1330 in what is now the city of Beijing. They settled alongside other ethnic groups as regimental guards for the Mongol Empire, all legally slave soldiers from Jurchid, Koreans, Turkic people. Mongol presence in China from the, the early 13th century through the first few decades of the 14th saw the earliest, saw the greatest influx of foreigners into the country. The eastward movement of people from Central and West Asia and Europe into China brought about a great diversity of population, language, and culture never before witnessed in China. And certainly, such diversity was never again witnessed in China after the Mongol rulers left the country in 1368. The reason we see China today as a homogeneous civilization based on a unitary Han identity is that after the end of the Yuan Dynasty, the new regime, a dynasty called the Ming, which had come to power on a strictly nativist platform closed China to all foreigners. Moreover, the new government required all foreigners and ethnic minorities within its boundaries to assimilate into Han Chinese civilization. All foreigners and non-Han people in China after the Yuan were forced to intermarry with Han Chinese people so that in a matter of generations, they would be absorbed into native culture and China would once again look homogeneous. Marco Polo, therefore, lived in an exceptional period in China, a period of great cultural diversity and expansiveness. Strictly speaking, the China of Marco Polo was not just the China of the Great Wall, chopsticks, tea, the bound feet, but it was also the China of Wager courtiers, Italian merchants, and Persian scholars and scientists. 
The Polos move to and settlement in China coincided largely with the earliest and the most magnificent and orderly period of the Yuan Dynasty in China, the final three decades of the 13th century. In 1271, the year they left Venice, the Yuan was established officially by Kublai Khan, the first alien prince to rule China. He had already acquired supremacy as the Khagan or Great Khan of the Mongol Empire in 1260. Three years after they departed China in 1291, Kublai's regime came to an end and the world empire of the Mongols, spanning the continents of Asia and Europe, went into irreversible fragmentation beginning in the 14th century. To this day, the outcry against Mongol assaults on sedentary civilizations in the writing of national history from Russia, Iran, Iraq, China to Japan still reminds us of the terrible extent of the damages that the Mongols made in their wars of conquest from East Asia to Eastern Europe. Yet it is also true that the Mongol conquest, once it ended, the people from the steppes constructed political systems and cultural arrangements that transcended traditional hierarchies and modernized social foundations. It is impossible to gauge if the contributions that Mongol rulers made as state builders qualitatively or quantitatively compensated for the atrocities that they had committed in wars. Yet by the time Marco Polo arrived in China, he, went in, he witnessed and lived under an extraordinary and brilliant imperial state that in many ways moved beyond deep-seated repressions of traditional sedentary civilizations. As newcomers to Chinese tradition and politics, the Mongol princes of the Yuan were remarkably more lax and open as rulers than their Chinese predecessors and successors. Confucianism was not their thousand-year-old heritage, and they had no ideological investment in the orthodox thought or speech. Freedom of thought and expression, religious tolerance, and cultural pluralism were a major cornerstone of the Mongol Empire in China. Kublai Khan's China enjoyed a unique period of intellectual, religious, and cultural tolerance not seen before or after in China. Chinese literature, art, drama, and political discourse flourished under Mongol rule in the 13th century. Yuan is the only period in the history of the Chinese empire when writers and artists could express themselves without any censorship or repression from the state. In all of the 98 years of Mongol rule in China, not one writer was arrested or executed for the content of his work, and this is remarkable in Chinese history. Before the Yuan, writers in China were executed for writing deemed offensive to the emperor. Once the Mongol rulers left China in 1368, the persecution of writers resumed and surged to an all-time high under the Ming Dynasty. Vernacular writing has seen its initial development early in the 13th century under the Song, the previous dynasty. It was under the Yuan that it flourished. Intellectual freedom and cultural tolerance under Mongol rulers ushered in the golden age of vernacular drama in China. Chinese was not the only vernacular language that flourished in China at this time. Mongol princes promoted the development of all vernacular languages of the empire, and they were the first rulers in China to establish a program of public education. Confucian education was limited to classical Chinese literature, and it functioned as the institutional basis for an imperial bureaucracy run by scholar officials. While Han Chinese education traditionally served the interests of official dub in this way, Mongols promoted universal education. They built public schools where all could learn to read and write in the vernacular. And the goal of public education was to teach the masses practical knowledge rather than classical Chinese learning. 
Were Confucian China traditionally restricted commerce and classified merchants as the lowest class of the citizen community, Kublai Khan improved conditions for trade and raised the legal and political status of merchants, including non-Han Chinese like Marco Polo and traders from Islamic civilization. Under Kublai Khan, China underwent progressive state formation and hyper-urbanization as an expansive network of cities supported the empire. The previous dynasty in China, the Song, restricted the settlement of foreign merchants to poor cities. The Yuan government, on the other hand, built new roads and constructed a network of postal stations throughout the empire to allow merchants to move about freely on business. Economic expansion was the hallmark of the Yuan dynasty, for Mongol princes had none of the suspicion or moral distaste for commerce that Confucian regimes traditionally had, and they promoted trades, trade with distant parts of the world, even investing their own wealth in trade ventures. Kublai Khan himself never spoke the Chinese language fluently. His command of the language was so poor that on important occasions, he required a translator. The Chinese vernacular was not the only vernacular language he promoted in the education program, for he also established schools for the Mongol language, including a Mongol university for, high, for the highest learning. Kublai Khan's imperial court, as well as other royal courts of Mongol states within the empire, employed scribes for a number of languages from Persian, Uyghur, Chinese, to Tibetan, Khitan, and several others. There was not just one lingua franca for the court or the empire, but several languages were important for different occasions and in different capacities. In China and the Golden Horde, a Mongol dominion in the northwest corner of the empire, the language that most frequently served as a lingua franca was Persian. Even before Kublai Khan, the great Khan Guyuk's letter to Pope Innocent IV in 1246 was composed in Persian. In this case, Persian served as a mediating language between Mongolian and Latin. Mongol officialdom was marked by the multiplicity of languages. The ability to translate from one language to another was prized at Mongol courts. Interpreters were held in high esteem by Mongol princes. Individuals who knew several languages or were good at speaking and learning foreign languages were much sought after throughout the Mongol Empire. Contemporary chroniclers noted that the successful administrator of the Mongol Empire was often one who could read, write, and speak multiple languages from Mongolian, Uyghur, Turkish, Persian, Khitan, Chinese, Hindi, and Arabic. The real question behind Francis Wood's taking issue with Marco Polo and similar expressions of reservation and doubt from other technologists is whether Marco Polo has the authority to speak on China and deserves a place in Chinese history. In the description, not only does Marco Polo seem to exaggerate his own importance and accomplishments in the East, but some of his claims just seem outright egregious lies to Sinologists. Moreover, the claim in the description that Marco Polo knows the country better than anyone else in the world because he made a point of getting to know the people and communities there must seem like a direct challenge to Sinologists who are eager to point out that the description does not accurately represent China. And this is from uh, the Marco Polo's account itself. Messer Marco came to know more about things in that country than any other man. He explored those foreign parts more than any man ever born, besides putting all his effort into this knowledge, end of quote. The text literally declares that the Venetian knew the Mongol dominated East better than even the native-born people there. 
And such a statement does not sit well with those who see themselves as representatives of Han Chinese civilization. Yet such a claim within the text reflects precisely the mindset of an immigrant who has found success in his adopted country and believes that, with hard work and intelligence, one can understand the system and operation of one's adopted country better than even its natives. Native-born locals may resent the claims such a newcomer makes on their country, but what an immigrant like Marco Polo does is that, because of his condition as a long-term non-Han Chinese resident in the East, he is able to bring a fresh perspective on his adopted country and shed light on specific aspects of civilization under Kublai Khan's China. And what he says about these specific aspects in turn reflects ideas about Chinese civilization that native Chinese people may not, may not have thought of before. You can turn yourself into an expert on a particular country, not because you're born and raised there and your family has been there since time immemorial, but because you moved there and you took time and energy to investigate and explore the communities there. In Marco Polo's China, Persians, Arabs, Mongols, and Europeans had an important presence in different communities and regions. As a merchant immigrant in China, Marco Polo must have been aware of other foreign settlers and operated near them. Within the Yuan Empire, individuals from Central and West Asia, most of them Islamic in faith and civilization, represented one of the most numerous, influential, and successful groups of foreign settlers in the empire. Scholars have long noted Persian influence in Marco Polo's account of China. In particular, the fact that Marco Polo's names for places in China are Persian names, such as Manji for Southern China. Moreover, Marco Polo shows an affinity for the deeds and presence of Islamic people in China. It is striking how Marco Polo's most notorious and doubtful claims about himself and his family in China actually also substantiate his knowledge of aspects and achievements of Islamic people in Chinese history. In specific instances, Marco Polo projects himself onto the history and success of these people under Kublai Khan's China. Most historians today don't believe at all Marco Polo's claim that he was governor of Yangzhou, China for three years. There is just no institutional record for his appointment in the empire. The fact that he named Yangzhou as the place where he achieved significant status of authority and distinction, however, is very significant. Yangzhou is a famous ancient trade city that has seen economic prosperity for centuries by the time Marco Polo went to China. It is a city historically known for the presence of foreign merchants, and the earliest group of foreign merchants to stay there were from Islamic civilization. As early as the, the Tang Dynasty, Yangzhou had already been a trade center that hosted foreign merchants from Islam, India, Korea, and Japan. Islamic geographers in the 9th and 10th century took special note of it because it set on a familiar international trade route and it was long known as a home away from home for Muslim traders. While Islamic people had long had an established history in Yangzhou by the 13th century, and there must have been a sizable settlement of Persians and Arabs in the city then, the presence of Italians in Yangzhou must have been also notable in Yuan China. Under Mongol rulers, there would have been a sizable settlement of Italian traders in Yangzhou, for we find the grave of an Italian woman buried there towards the mid-14th century. Because Yangzhou historically was the city where foreign merchants settled and found success, the place becomes a means for Marco Polo to express his personal success in China. The most glaringly egregious fiction in the description 
is Marcos taking credit for his for the achievements of two Muslim engineers named Ismail and Allah al-Din, who built the siege engines that broke the final stronghold in southern China, Xiangyang, in the beginning of Kublai's reign as the emperor of the Yuan. The two Muslim engineers were key members of an ethnically and culturally diverse team of military and technical personnel under Kubla, who took the city after besieging it for a number of years in the early 1270s before the Polos arrived in the country. The Mongol troops were led by a Uyghur general who consulted with the Mongol delegate and Han Chinese advisors while Koreans and Jurchen were the shipbuilders. The account of the siege of Xiangyang in Marco Polo's book shows an accurate understanding of the event and its significance in history. But it presents a different team of personnel performing the action. Instead of Ismail and Allah al-Din, in the description it is Marco Polo himself and his father and uncle who built the trebuchets that took down Xiangyang with the help of a German and historian in their service. The Venetian writer recreates the event by inserting himself and his family into an important history in the his important moment in the history of the Yuan dynasty in China, portraying themselves as key players in the successful expansion of the Mongol Empire. Most of the details of the event in Marco's account are accurate, from the three-year duration of the siege to the strategic position of the city and the importance of its downfall in the conquest of southern China, but all these details serve to frame a made-up story about the Polo's feats of engineering wonder in the service of the great Khan. Even as he makes up the story of the Polo's involvement in history, Marco Polo seems to understand what it means to serve the Mongol ruler and the conditions of multiplicity embodied in the experience of imperial service by portraying the personnel involved as multicultural, multilingual, and multi-ethnic, coming from different backgrounds. And in this case, Polo envisions a team of personnel headed by a family of Venetian merchants and supported by a German and an historian. They're all Christian, but even within this Christian group, there is diversity. Besides the influence of Islamic Chinese culture in the description, did Marco Polo come into contact with Han Chinese people and their ideas and practices after all? Chinese historian Li Zifen has firmly denied that Marco Polo had an authentic or proper understanding of Chinese civilization. For the Venetian clearly did not know classical Chinese, could not have read the great literary classics of China, and therefore could not have had access to or knowledge of the cream of Chinese civilization, the refinements and tradition of the high elite. For him, Venice was a backwater of the world compared to China in the 13th century, and while Marco could have learned the language of the Mongolians, he could not have learned the much more complicated and refined language of the Chinese people, especially literary Chinese, because as a European, he was simply not equipped with the cultural and linguistic apparatus for the high learning and deep thinking as the Chinese had been for thousands of years. If Marco came into contact with Han Chinese people in, in China, Li asserts, these would have been the lowly laborers on the docks, the riffraff of the community, the working people who spoke the vernacular of the streets. Marco Polo's representation of Chinese civilization in the description, in my opinion, does largely reflect his interest in the everyday speech and vernacular culture of China, rather than the high tradition of learning and classical Confucianism. But precisely because the description represents the common people's China and its vernacular, it is all the more precious an historical account of the Yuan dynasty in China. In Marco Polo's book, we find the use of the Chinese term, Ma to, for the first time recorded in history, 
albeit in the Latin alphabet. Readers familiar with the Chinese language will, will tell you readily that ma to means port, pier, or quay in Chinese, as Sharon Kinoshita's translation informs us, because it is a common term in modern Chinese. What is at once strange and marvelous about Marco's use of this term, though, is that it's the earliest use of the term we could find. Other than Marco Polo's reference to Mato, the earliest use of this word printed in the Chinese language in Chinese characters is from the year 1627 in China. In a minor work of narrative fiction entitled Stories to Awaken the World, more than 300 years after Marco Polo's use of the term in his old French account. If I am right in my observation, Marco Polo deserves credit for being the first writer to record the use of the Chinese term Marto, and he probably did not even speak the Chinese vernacular fluently. This certainly suggests to me that the Venetian merchant must have acquired a certain familiarity with vernacular expression in Chinese while he was in the East. Indeed, he was a man who must have had a familiar presence in ports and trade routes, and this work registers the everyday language of the common people at the docks. Another suggestion of Marco Polo's assimilation of local values and practices is his identification of a second cousin as a nephew. He describes the great Khan's second cousin, Kaiju, as a nephew to the emperor. And in Kenoshita's translation, we see a note correcting Marco Polo's kinship reference. But nephew would probably have been how Kublai Khan as a Mongol and East Asians in general address the son of their first cousin. And Marco Polo is actually conforming properly to Confucian East Asia's kinship classification including Han Chinese understanding of family relations. Because Kaidu is a member of the younger generation of the imperial family, he in Confucian terms is a nephew to Kubla and owes Kubla respect as an uncle. The text classification of kinship relations between Kubla and Kaidu is meant clearly to emphasize the serious offense of Kaidu in his rebellious activities as Kubla, against Kubla, especially because he was a nephew to the emperor. When he first arrived in Kubla Khan's court, Marco Polo turned himself into the polyglot that was especially prized in the Mongol ruling order. He learned multiple languages of the Mongol Empire, and the process of his learning, acquiring knowledge of the Mongol Empire, and transforming himself he calls it a marvel. The use of the term reflects the Venetian author's overall interest in the marvel as the expression of dynamic process and constant transformation. As Simon Gaunt has pointed out, Marco Polo's use of the marvel as a concept departs fundamentally from the traditional medieval European notion. While the marvel in medieval European discourse conjured up figures of monsters and supernatural phenomena. The vast majority of marvels in the description focus on natural phenomena and external reality, often social and political events and processes. The Italian merchant gets especially excited when describing trade goods and the way they can be converted into wealth or exchanged for other valuable commodity. So marvel is very often how he describes the sight of merchandise in markets. The great quantity of silk in the market was a marvel. Describing the process by which ships loaded and unloaded great quantities of trade goods on trips between southern and northern China, the narrator again applies the word marvel and marvelous to explain, explain the way trade works. As Sharon Kinoshita has suggested, Kublai Khan himself is also what occasions marvel, the greatest source of wonder in Marco Polo's book. He is the man whose great political power effects change and makes things happen. Celebrating himself as the multilingual wonder, 
the polyglot of great talent from the West in Kubla Khan's court, Marco Polo conceptualizes the condition of learning multiple languages and making use of the values and practices of multiple cultures as marvel. He is aware of himself as a man of constant transformation, moving between cultures and communities, making use of ideas and practices from other cultures and reshaping them to create his own story and to present an image of his own accomplishment in Kubla Khan's empire. He is a man who does not simply record history, but also wishes to make history and reveal his active contribution to major events in the history of the Mongol Empire. All of this was possible under the Yuan, the most diverse and tolerant and the only truly multicultural and multilingual period in Chinese history. What the description does is give us a glimpse into the consciousness of a Venetian immigrant in Mongol China and his access to everyday diversity of the country, a diversity that has not been recorded in the official and authoritative histories of China, but one that was real and affected the working people of the country. The immigrant history of China would soon come to an abrupt, silent end after 1368, when the Yuan ended and the Ming began. Under the Ming, the making of modern Chinese identity took on a nationalistic turn, and our notion of Han Chinese civilization today can be traced back to the Ming, with its notion of Chineseness as homogeneous and nativist. And it serves as all well today to read Marco Polo's description of the world to remind ourselves once upon a time, China was diverse, open, under Mongol influence, somewhat Islamic, and a little Venetian. Thank you.